I'm going to talk about some data you've not seen, most likely. I think it's been presented. I presented at a small group, Cotton and Shoulder Society, but never in, in a meeting. And um, anyway, you can see what you think of this. But I'm very interested in value and innovation, and particularly in digital. And so uh, I do have conflicts here. They're important that I should say. Uh, I'm involved in a number of the technologies I'll talk about. But let me give you some perspective. It was Charlie Neer who said shoulder arthroplasty gives good pain relief and function with durable and durable results in thoughtful, capable hands. And we've seen that here all day long. Um, Valsh and uh, uh, Mark Frankel here were debating, and uh, at, this was at the ASAP meeting some years ago, and Valsh said, I plan the glenoid all the time, and uh, you know, Mark Frankel said, I don't need to plan anything. I just have my hands do it. Um, so it was also Rick Matson who commented that um, we really don't need CT scans. It's an unnecessary expense for our patients, and it's not necessary to correct glenoid retroversion when you perform most total shoulder arthroplasties. We're not talking about reverse. Fascinating to say that was Christian Gerber who pointed out that the result is never better than the plan. And in addition to that, um, Codman, I think, would have liked digital tools, or at least a promise of them. Gerber said if you do the operation in your mind before you do it in the patient, you always do better. So planning makes some sense. Although Codman got fired from the Mass General Hospital for this cartoon, which shows physicians being paid for things that don't work. This is the golden ostrich, ostrich kicking golden eggs to the physicians for what they're doing, not their outcomes. And uh, this was blessed really by the board at the Mass General, and they didn't appreciate his jokes. So we already talked about value, and value is important here because if we're looking at outcome, that's one thing, but um, now we're talking about digital technology that is not inexpensive. And so we'll talk a little bit about the revenue model here, but nothing can survive if it's an innovation unless it makes a profit. It's just the way it is. Otherwise, it doesn't have any ability to sustain itself. So the question I asked is, what does industry want? What do surgeons want? And what the patients want or need, will we tell them what they want or need? So um, in my way of thinking, we would like shorter learning curves with fewer complications. We would like reduced errors in planning, avoiding wrong surgery and the wrong plan, reducing errors in execution, engineering error avoidance, improving constructs for better biomechanics, meaning more durability. And that's important because it's hard to measure that return on the investment over at, at, in the initial uh, going of it and improve patient experience. So if you would look here, and I showed this before, value is time dependent. So depends when your hospital or the, in, or the companies are measuring the outcomes to determine the value, because if you do something that results in durability at a greater expense during the episode of care that is borne by the hospital, the hospital loses money. It gives away its margin in order to give the patient a better outcome, and the only one capturing the value is the patient. And that's a difficult proposition for us and our patients. I showed you this already, only to show you this again, that the overall spend in the, in the global level for last year for orthopedic sales was $57 billion. And if you look at the breakdown of this, extremities are here, but enabling technology is 2.1% of all the expend, and that includes um, surgical planning, robotics, navigation, patient monitoring, et cetera. That's some of the things I'll talk about. Now, the way I like to look at this is, it, let's call this a digital episode of care. When do you begin this episode? Does it begin pre-op, and then you have intra-op, and then what about aftercare? But in reality, it actually begins in education beforehand, which is probably important. Why that's important, I'll tell you in a moment. But all these different alphabet here, the AI, the, the AR, the MR, et cetera, are what I'm talking about. And industry has to make strategic decisions what it wish, wishes to deliver. And you, the surgeons, have to decide what, what they want. And so briefly to comment, and it wasn't in the list, but we can't ignore it, is virtual reality and disrupting surgical education. And this was a picture from Mayo Clinic. You know, I, actually, I'm not sure if it's from Mayo Clinic, but wherever it is, it's a bit crazy. Halstead said, see one, do one, teach one. And William Mayo said, in 1920, there's no excuse today for the surgeons to learn on the patient. Well, how do they do what they do? And our patients suffer for their learning curves. And so the potential for a virtual reality, and there are a number of players here, as you see, I do have a conflict here, but I put the other ones up as well, is that you can have borderless education. So here I'm showing you a virtual reality session we had in the metaverse with Switzerland representatives, Canadian representatives, Ireland representatives, American and, you know, and, and others. And so um, none of us left home. 
And I've zoomed back out here and you can see we connected first with Vancouver, then with Ireland, uh, then with Switzerland and back again as well. And so just briefly, if you listen to this interaction for a few minutes, you get an idea about this. Can you turn the sound a bit? And uh, uh, from all different countries. So we have Florian and Carl from Switzerland and Ruth Delaney from Ireland. And then we've got Danny and John from Canada, from the western part of Canada, Vancouver. And then, of course, I'm in Boston. And we're, we're all together in a virtual operating room. Ruth, you're familiar with this, right? Yeah, a little bit, sure. Yeah. Okay. So actually, why don't we uh, change a little bit? I'm going to make a fist. We can fist bump. And then you're going to be the operator. Okay. So now Ruth has the power. So Ruth, show everybody how the um, bet goes up and down, perhaps. And bet the, going down? Sure. Over to the level. Yeah. You want. I can make this come right down for me where I might like it to be for me. I'm just going to skip uh, ahead a little bit to show you. 35 degree angle. And um, the saw is in my left hand. So the green region, as I see fit with this. And so once this is set here and we have the same retractors that you talked about, Florian, um, that, and now I can make it that. So the point I'm making is we're interacting. We have not left home. Imagine the possibilities with an app like we have on your iPhone, but we have now a virtual reality app, app uh, library to do all these operations. So that's one area we're not considering, but also we should ask the question, what is the value of planning, virtual planning? We talked a little bit about that today. And there's a number of articles that demonstrate that if you just plan, you convert less experienced surgeons to making better decisions or more, uh, more accurate decisions that do more expert surgeons. And so simply learning how to plan virtually improves what you do in the operating room without any kind of guide. And Ionati showed us the reliability and reproducibility of patient-specific software and uh, guidance, which you saw today. And then, of course, there's navigation uh, and done with different, different technologies. Uh, and the value of AR and MRI is a little confusing because augmented reality, and a lot of this was really given to me from George, augmented reality is basically one thing and mixed reality is something else. And mixed reality is taking the virtual world into the real world and augmenting, augmented reality is augmenting what is in the real world already. And here you see venipuncture being used with augmented reality. Robots, of course, we heard a talk about, they're coming. Um, the revenue model there is very clear. And the interesting thing is that all these things are happening with collaboration with areas outside of healthcare, which for better or for worse are making decisions about how they value us as partners. And as, as we may talk about, um, they don't value us as much as they value the gaming industry, for example. So these are just the, the the um, revolutions that you've seen here, steam power, electricity, information technology, and then AI has been called the fourth revolution. So it was Steve Jobs who said, everyone here has a sense that right now is one of those moments when we're influencing the future. So I asked a question, what do we think and what does industry think? Is that the case? So I sent the survey to SESIC, to ASCS, to the Codman Shoulder Society, and then to, to eight industry leaders in this area, of six of whom answered in an anonymized fashion. So I can't tell you which six have what opinion, but I'll only share with you a little overview. And I'm gonna go through this a bit fast, but one of the things important to point out, if you look at the colors, um, green is SESIC and red is ASES and blue is Codman Shoulder Society, most everybody who answered these questionnaires were experts. They were more senior in terms of their skill set. However, the number of years in practice was quite broad. And, um, you know, what percentage of shoulder arthroplasty varied from 10 to 50 percent about. Uh, so the sweet spot was kind of mid midway between that. And interestingly, uh, how many do uh, more than 40 per year? And you can see there's a, a distribution here clearly indicating that these really were high volume surgeons, which goes along with being experts. And then the question is, do you do preoperative planning, and that's a broad open question, but the answer is that the majority believe some kind of preoperative planning is appropriate. And then do you use preoperative planning tools? And most individuals in both sides of the Atlantic use preoperative planning tools. When I ask them, however, what are these tools, I think there's a lot of confusion because if you look at VR planning and other, in the category of other, you see all these things here, and the larger the print, the more commonly used, they get confused what is VR planning and which of these is VR planning versus something else. And so that was a confusing question for everybody, even though everyone's doing planning. 
And then we ask, do you use any of the following digital technology to execute your plan in the operating room? And you can see AR, MR, navigation, robotics, and other, and the other were patient-specific guides in the vast majority of cases. Whether these were reusable or whether they were um, not, there's, there, it's a little confusing for me to sort that out. Now, what's interesting here is what is your expectation for how digital technology can help you in the future in shoulder arthroplasty? And overwhelming number one was AI. That's an important point to remember. Dif different reasons, but AI. And then came navigation and AR and robotics. Mixed reality was on the low level. And then other and other included things like predicting post-operative range of motion and sensors and things of that nature. And then finally, what would you like to see coming from industry? Again, AI was the leader, improved VR, then navigation, then robotics, then maybe metaverse, what I showed you before, which is low priority, it seems. Uh, and, and if you look here in the other category, all these other wish, wish items, okay? Now, do you think there's a need for post-op management tools? Interestingly, most physicians thought yes. And when asked what are these app-based recovery tools, things of that nature, and you can sort of see the menu here, it's a bit busy. But clearly, they wanted this industry not at all really interested in this at all because they can't figure the revenue model. Now, I went to industry, and then I said, what are your company's priorities and application in digital healthcare? And what was clear is that AI is aligned with what surgeons want. And then it goes down the list here. And uh, it, fascinating to me to see, actually, robotics was relatively low of all the ones that answered. And I know for a fact that the two companies that are doing robotics were, were answering these questionnaires, and MR and et cetera. So there's, there's some general alignment. How do you think digital healthcare will create value in shoulder arthroplasty? Well, number one was reducing errors. Number two is creating data that informs on best practices. And number three was improved efficiency, and then we go down from there. Low cost was at the very bottom of the list, okay? And then what is your strategy in the AI application? And this was, I don't have time to go through all these different things, but it was very fuzzy, very unclear exactly what they were going to do. And, um, you know, from priorities, you'd be happy to know that we all, are slightly above patients as customers because, of course, we're the drivers, the influencers, and the hospitals were lower. And they actually put employees and shareholders at the bottom, which is kind of interesting for me, given what they do. Then what is your planned revenue model? And nobody answered. It was all other, which should give some insight that from this I glean that there is a real problem in the revenue model for AI in orthopedics, not in the rest of the world, but in orthopedics. They don't understand how to get back their investment by using AI. And in my opinion, the only way to do that is indirectly by attaching the digital technology to the implants that are used so people use more of the implants. So the future, I think, is loading. If I would summarize all this, what do I take away from this? At this point in time, industry does not have a clear revenue model for digital technology. A value can't really be determined at this time. AI is the number one priority for surgeons in industry, but neither one really knows how it's going to be applied for the best impact. The um, value of AI and cost to industry remains a question mark. AR and MR are yet to be monetized. Uh, sub a, a software as a service model for software is not established in orthopedics at this time. VR has potential for the greatest value, but is underestimated by surgeons and industry. And then surgeons want tools for post-operative recovery, but that is not at all a priority for industry. Thank you.